been mad. I'm going to shade that a little bit. <laughs> so we're waiting for uh, Peter to come back and then going to get this on the show. Right. Just, um, oh, it's no better, is it? Yeah. It's so, it's okay. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome to the uh, 17th episode of the Gutenberg Times Live Q&A. And my name is Birgit Pali Hark, and I'm the host and the curator of Gutenberg Times. Thank you all for watching. It's great to have you. In today's show, we will discuss using Gutenberg to bring speed and flexibility to news and editorial sites. It will be a discussion around how custom blocks allow journalists to compose engaging layouts with the help of designers. It sounds a little bit technical, but we we'll remedy that in a bit when we do some uh, live um, demos. Um, I'm extremely honored to have uh, Peter Yukas, a, a dramatist, screenwriter, author, journalist, and now publisher from London. Uh, Thomas Eagle and Andrew Staffel, is it Staffel or Staffel? Or Staffel? Staffel, Staffel, I think, yeah. As far as I as far as I know, yeah. All right. <laughs> Could be <Stephel>. Could be. <laughs> from the agency Yes We Work, uh, who worked with Byline Times, not only on the online newspaper, uh, but also on the print edition. And they are here to tell us how they did it. Thank you very much, David. Good evening. Okay. Thank um, you, Beckett. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad you're here. We do some uh, proper introduction in a minute, and uh, but I have a few housekeeping notes. So this week at Gutenberg Times, we published the second episode of our Gutenberg uh, Changelog podcast, and you learn about the presentations we heard at conferences and word games, work in progress in Gutenberg, enhancing columns, multi-block handling, and enhancing tables. And we also answer listener questions. Speaking of questions, for those who are watching this on YouTube live stream, use the chat box next to the video player to pose your questions or just uh, have a conversation with us. Um, and uh, But include where you're watching from. So over the next 15 minutes or so, we talk um, the start of byline times, I think, the technology challenges it faced, and we talk about the decisions on editorial aspects, technology aspects, workflow, and publishing processes. And we will hopefully talk about the world before Gutenberg and after Gutenberg was introduced into the content production process. And uh, whatever we, uh, the lessons learned from publishing side as well from the technology side. So let's get started with some short introductions. Peter, you are a legend in the 21st century journalism <laughs> with <laughs> large tweeting of the phone hacking trial in um, was it 2013? Yeah. Yeah, and 40. <laughs> so, and 40 yeah. yeah, it took an 18 months trial, right? Um, and you were the first to take this on Twitter, um, I believe, uh, to the next level, to getting the word out uh, to more people and not just in the news bubble kind of thing. Um, so you're also a screenwriter and a, of award-winning TV premise. The list of the internet uh, movie database is over a mile long, so... <laughs> Very prolific. <laughs> you are the CEO of um, Byline Media Limited. So how did those transitions come about, moving from fiction to nonfiction and being a business manager and a uh, journalist? Oh, my, there's a long version. I'll give you the short version. Um, you know, we've got an hour. <laughs> we've got an hour. Okay, so sit back and get your cocos out. Um, no, basically, it's, I might put this in my Twitter bio the other day. I was driven out of uh, fiction by the fierce urgency of fact. I mean, I'd known a lot of journalists, the mother of my kids, a senior BBC journalist. Uh, and I've kind of, I always stole stories from journalists as a, as a dramatist. But at some point about 10 years ago, and partly inspired by my mentor and hero, the historian Tony Judd, who said the only true public intellectuals these days, like Albert Camus or uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, were investigative journalists. I wrote a bit of journalism about the BBC, which rather curtailed my career there, because uh, I wrote about what was going wrong there, why Britain can't write things like The Wire. And then when the Murdoch, the phone hacking came along, um, I was already doing quite a lot of political blogging. I worked on the Obama campaign, but 
but I realised there was a problem with Monopoly, like I kind of criticised the BBC for. And then I got to know Nick Davis, you know, became a friend, and the amazing hinterland of journalists. And, 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 and since things have got worse since I started, I was thinking the phone hacking trial was kind of an instruction manual for Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and and so as, as life's got worse, I've done more journalism, and it's a brilliant profession. You get to meet brilliant people, and I do feel I will go back to fiction. I still do write some fiction. There's mm-hmm. a famous podcast I did. I told the Daniel Morgan murder, which had 10 million downloads, and I want to turn that into drama. But in the meantime, it's much more exciting writing an article knowing you could lose your house <laughs> than a TV show thinking you might just get a bad. All right. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, this is uh, investigative journalism um, needs to be totally different funded, though, than uh, yeah. uh, with the um, other publications. Um, and there is a, a big international collaboration going on uh, with the Center for Investigative Journalism, I think. I know yeah. that um, in my hometown, there were two journalists that. Um, did the Panama Papers, um, or yeah, spearheaded that, but with a, a 200 journalists who were involved in that. Um, right. it, it's uh, very interesting how that field can do so much more for democracy than any other political institution if they would want to. Well, two problems there. One is I started writing first the Daily Beast as a journalist under, because I knew Harry Evans and Tina Brown, his partner, editor. And I wrote back in 2013, I realized that Google and Facebook uh, were taking 40 billion out of publishing. And so when I became not only a freelance journalist, and it's how to fund journalism. We had a crowdfunding platform, uh, but that sometimes works. Uh, and there's n- so many stories not being told. I'm overwhelmed by stories. Amazing stories came today, but we can't cope. Uh, uh, we're going back as just moving over to the Byline Times, a slightly more traditional model subscriptions, you know, print and advertising. We're talking to advertisers about now we've got enough traffic getting yeah. on board. It's not a, a complete solution. Uh, and we will do some crowdfunding as well. And Andrew and Thomas are helping us with the crowdfunding appeal coming up soon. And it's got to do everything because nobody wants to pay for journalism. Mm-hmm. And of course, they never did. This is the difference. Advertisers pay for it. Right. And the cost of a newspaper, the, the cover price, 10 people at the Times, that paid for the print cost. All the journalism was paid for. Don McCullen going to Vietnam was paid for by the Gucci ad. Mm-hmm. And then Facebook and Google intervene, take all the money, and don't really provide the content. So we are, and I think a lot of the things we're seeing with Trump election and Brexit and the rise of the alt-right or populist movements throughout Europe are partly down, but not in Germany. Very good. They keep, you know, certain places keep it going. The decline of good local journalism, of good national journalism. Yeah, yeah, and Germany, uh, mostly of it is uh, public funded as well. Yeah. Wow, wow. I'm moving. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, interesting. So, Thomas, you're the director and designer of um, Yes We Work, and you and Andrew built the tools to improve information and collaboration online. But uh, as an agency, you focus on the academic, editorial, cultural, and social project. That's a big, big, big bowl. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't do all of it, obviously. But, yeah. um, in fact, we met Peter. Well, I met Peter at a, a press regulator event in London. So fun one party. of the organisations. Sorry? Fun party, a press regulator event. Yeah, exactly. So well, it was quite good. It was quite good being the only designer at a press regulator event. It was a good, it was a good thing to do. It was a fascinating event as well. But um, um, Andrew and I had discussed us going to that because we'd done some work before with Wiki Tribune. So we built some back-end technical things in the journalism sort of space, in the collaborative journalism field, trying to make WordPress more like a Wiki, the Wiki Tribune. Yeah. And yeah, because so of that... You did, you did a project with uh, Wiki Tribune to, uh, um, for the new... Uh, Wiki Tribune, which is a new initiative by... Not so new anymore, but the Jimmy Rails... Yeah. who is the founder of Wikipedia. And uh, so what were the issues that you worked on there? Just well, to- there it was, it was making, um, it was very WordPress technical. So really Andrew should, would be the best person as a developer, would be the best person to describe it. 
Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. we worked on two um, very specific problems for them um, to do with collaborative editing. Um, and this was very definitively in a pre-Gutenberg era, which I suppose is relevant. Although the things that we were working on, um, they weren't really to do with the editor experience itself. They were more to do with what happens when several people try to edit the same content at the same time. Um, and uh, the other problem was they needed basically to be able to have um, edit, because in WordPress, I think even now, um, once a piece is published, if someone makes a change to it, that change can't be put in the queue for moderation. It's basically uh, an edit is an edit that goes immediately live. And they needed mainly for legal reasons um, to have moderation functionality built in. So those are the problems that we were looking at for Wikitribune. Um, it, it just, it feels relevant to say that it was in a pre-Gutenberg era because I think some of the other problems that they were, they were dealing with at the same time around, um, because of course they were trying to allow everyone to do the whole premise was to allow everyone to collaborate absolutely everyone even people with no knowledge of wordpress or content editing at all and so they came up very quickly with problems relating to or issues concerning uh, the edit the editor experience and and i think and we knew obviously that gutenberg this was um a, a year and a half ago was it end of 2017 we knew that gutenberg was on the way but it was still far too early Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the fact that the fact that Gutenberg is still the goalposts are still still moving um, around. Um, yes. I don't know if that's the right metaphor, but the things are still changing very rapidly with the underlying tech is an issue that um, we are continuing to confront now. But anyway, that's that's a slight digression. But yeah. that's, that's the Wiki Tribune. Yeah, but you still will get um, some help from Gutenberg with uh, with the phase three, which actually has that problem. Um, about collaboration and moderation um, for the for the next year probably um, on on yeah. the horizon. Yeah, that's right. We, well, we we had some um, there were some conversations taking place at the time. In fact, um, Jimmy Wales, who we were working for directly on Wiki Tribune, um, he spoke to uh, Matt mm -hmm. like, about the collaborative editing issues that we were dealing, and and so. We're not sure, but um, it's possible that some of the, the planning that then came out for phase three and four was influenced by those conversations that were taking place at the time. Yeah, um, I, I think that you might be right that that's kind of a catalyst of the, the planning for, because the second, the fourth phase is going to be internationalization, which yeah. also is into this worldwide information. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very clear that, that those, the, the features that we were, or the, the, the problems that we were looking at for Wiki Tribune are still, they still exist actually. And revisions remains a big, uh, what's the right phrase? I mean, it, it, revisions haven't really been touched in Gutenberg at all. And now because of the comment tags being part of the content, what you see when you look at the revisions manager in, in Gutenberg is something that's not very easy to use for edit, especially for editorial people. I mean, and there are things like um, revisions of images, which are code, take place in code, they're very difficult to see. You can't see visually, at least with the current revisions editor, what the consequences of those would, would be. And actually that's one of the things we, we developed for um, Wiki Tribune at the time was a visual view um, for the revisions editor. Yeah, um, all right. Yeah. Well, thank you for getting us down a little bit that lane with what, uh, what, uh, what it's needed now and yeah. what might come um, in, in Gutenberg. So Andrew and, and Thomas, you are, I noticed that you are in business now together for 11 years. Uh, yes, right. we've been working together for, for all of that time, yeah. Call me that old. Yes. <laughs> no, Andrew is not, I am. What, what, no. Oh. <laughs> um, Was it wrong? No, 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 that's right. No, no, no. <laughs> no, we met in we met in um, through a mutual friend in Spain. We were both living in well, Andrew yeah. still is. I lived in Spain at the time, yeah. so we met outside a a bar in Seville, and um, Andrew said, "Oh, I I build websites. Yeah, but... I don't really like designing them." And I said, "Oh, I build websites, but I can't code really." <laughs> and so we started working together, and since then, we've been like working solidly together, and yeah. almost I mean, there are. A few other people that come in and help, and there's another developer called Drow who works on this and things. But the bulk of it is just the two of us. Yeah. Um, and especially everything that was done on byline times. I mean, 
we're lucky to be to have worked with Peter and Hardeep and Stephen and Ella and all of the writers who are incredibly will do everything, tackle every single task, do anything, try anything. Like it's a, it's a, a, a remarkable thing to work I, with. I think it, and I, and I think it's relevant to say that um, a, a lot of what we're doing, a lot of our thinking around what we're gonna do next with the tools we've built for Byland. Maybe this is jumping ahead, perhaps is, but that we are thinking in terms of these tools being useful for small teams like yeah. our, like our, like us and like uh, Peter and his team um, in contrast to maybe um, other solutions that are being conceived for you know massive newsrooms and so on um, we, we I guess we think along those lines because it's specifically how we've always worked we've been a small team and we're now working with a small team yeah. uh, but that I'm probably jumping ahead we're, we're cutting out the part where we sort of explain what we've done so far well well let's let's take it back and say let's start at the beginning of Twilight times peter <laughs> we already talked um yeah how you started out and what the today technology challenges were and when you okay i need to get andrew and thomas in to help us out yeah how far can you push it yourself uh, that was what the spanish who I, i'm my company is called duende productions because i love flamenco music and the concept of duende, the dark spirit of chance and sort of creativity. So it's complete duende uh, that I met Thomas. And, and, uh, and he immediately got what I was talking about, which is, well, you know, we, the previous platform, byline.com, which I kind of inherited the crowdfunding one, was built bespoke by South Korean games developers. It all ran in JSON, which is impossible to deal with. And I, but I also was a bit worried about WordPress, everything's on WordPress, how do you make it different? And I looked and actually written to Arc, you know, the publishers of the software that make for Washington Post, you know, get something. But they never got back to me because they obviously, my chip would not be anything big enough for them, you know, and, and, and it's just really fortuitous, uh, especially with the background and the visual sense. So what the, the sort of challenge I sort of presented them was, um, can we have something that doesn't look all singing, dancing, pop-ups, clickbait, videos, podcasts, techie, something a little bit old school that has the quality of, of print. And for me, having moved from the crowdfunding thing, we wanted to edit heavily. We wanted at the masthead to have authority. And before, I don't know if this happened before, after I met you, already working with designers on how to get what we wanted to do was, uh, unlike the era of fake news, where you know we can follow the Russian trolls or the Macedonian spam houses, you know they create these fake news sites, they use something or other and put fake news out there, and so you lost all trust in the masthead. Byline.com was do you trust the writer you, but still that's not enough. You still wanted to create something where you trust the brand, and that the whole thing, no matter what individual writers, is a common standard of you know, separating fact um, from argument, you know, common argument. It's not just common, you're making an argument from the facts and also legally edited and designed. And so I so said, can you create us a paper which a superhero <laughs> would make? Because the, the Byline Times is based on the kind of like the Daily Planet. You know, the, it's that idea that days when journalists were superheroes, because in the UK, they're some of the most distrusted people. Mm -hmm. and, Mm. So that was our challenge to you guys, wasn't it? And yes, I suppose, it yeah, and we should say now how we how we how we picked it up from there, should we? Well, it was um, it was also no. So uh, if I understood it correctly, you were not um, kind of hacking on team, kind of on a WordPress side, and then brought an outside team in to make it. You you moved away from a different that um, yeah. to WordPress. Okay, yeah. And yeah, the is was already in. You're already in WordPress, weren't you? When we started working with you, you yeah. already had bylinetimes.com as a WordPress site, which you put together your, largely yourself, hadn't you? Don't tell anybody that because it was terrible. Um, <laughs> no, no, it was really important. No, it, it was no, very no, good. I, no, it was. Uh, I think it was just to test out, by the way, I think it was simultaneously with meeting us. We had about a four month development phase before launch, maybe a bit longer, maybe five. And I was just testing out WordPress. Pretty soon I met you, it was like about the same time. Right, okay, yeah. So, I mean, as Peter said, he said 
the, the brief was to do something that was a mixture of the Daily Planet and print news of the 50s, 60s, yeah. 70s sort of thing. So, so yeah. We picked it up when, when there was a, uh, an existing beta site. Um, it was on wordpress.com. It was using one of the wordpress.com templates. Um, and um, it, was, it was amazingly, there was an amazing, I mean, you were, there were already very complete um, homepage or editorial pages on there. Um, but I suppose the, the, uh, very relevant to mention, of course, is that it was pre, it wasn't Gutenberg. It was, so it was, for, it was this was November or something. So it was 4.9. Um, and the situation was sort of from a technical point of view or design point of view was that um, Peter had installed, because of course, the, a theme, a, an off the shelf theme, more or less all, you always run into limitations with what you want to do. Um, Peter had installed CSS Hero or one of one of these things that gave, gave you uh, you know deep control over over CSS, and so was using that very um, skillfully to make changes. But I suppose we felt that that you've at the same time with something like CSS Hero got lot plenty of flexibility, but actually so much that you're paralysed with options and you can and you lose consistency. Hmm. So we were absolutely certain that we were going to use Gutenberg for it because of the increased, I mean, for all kinds of reasons, because it was just obviously the way to go, but also because of the, you know, the way it's gone much closer towards real WYSIWYG. So you can, if, if you can use it to, for layout stuff, then you're going to be able to see it in the editor in a way that you never could before. We used to use um, the flexible content field in ACF to achieve the closest thing we could possibly achieved that we didn't we were never fans of page builders because we like to be able to do all of our code um, you know touch all of our code but we used we like to use the flexible content field in ACF and so that was we then said about figuring out exactly how much flexibility they would need as an editorial team um, in order to achieve the brief to meet the brief that Peter's just described um, and then to deliver that as a set of not um, option paralyzing um, tools as blocks in Gutenberg so they could build the layouts they needed to build. So that was our brief, you know, achieve the flexibility. I mean, this is the content management system brief across the board, isn't it? Achieve the flexibility you need without creating uh, paralyzing decisions for the people who have to manage the content. And so um, I think, well, judging by the first few months of um, operation, I think uh, it's, 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 we've done a decent job at getting to that point. And then we're, we've got plans to evolve from there. Yeah, in fact, we're never, we're never needed. Like on the website, <laughs> we're just never needed. Like there was a phase at the beginning where we thought, oh, you know, they'll need a bit of design work every month and we'll get some more, you know, work in that phase. And they've never needed us, which in a way is the pinnacle of, of success at the same time as being a terrible thing for us. For us it's the pinnacle. <laughs> <laughs> your editorial team can do everything they need to do with Gutenberg without ever calling on you, without ever paying for your, your, that extra service. If oh, that's one contribution that we can do to try to make local reporting and investigative journalism more sustainable, just make it easier for people to manage their own things, then that would be a, a fantastic result. Um, so yeah, as Andrew said, we kind of, we took the, the original brief and, and we decided that internal pages would just use standard Gutenberg, like we'd nail things down in terms of styles and fonts. And, and the frame. Page, yeah. Frame, but it would use normal Gutenberg so that people could put in, so that Pete and the team and Hardy could put in an image and then a reusable block to point to some other post and then um, headlines and drop caps and a limited number of things and it would still be consistent. And then also we did um, image filters so that you could apply, you could make any selection of images look like they belong to the same thing. So we use CSS filters to do that. And that seemed to me to be quite, because I was the designer, it seemed to me to be quite an important thing because it, image, the, the variation in imagery, if you're using stock, if you're not a, a huge newsroom with a huge photo budget yeah. and star photographers, the variation in photography that you have is vast. So anything you can do to make your photography look more like it's the part of the same trustworthy brand 
seemed like a, a good thing to do. Anyway, and, and, and so no, but it's for that, that we could plug into the add block style, register block style functionality in Gutenberg straight away, like with very, very little complication. So that, that API was really, really useful for us to be able to add that consistency without too much, um, too much additional coding. Yeah. Um, and then what we really concentrated on to, to achieve what Peter had asked for was the editorial kind of front page. I mean, you could use it for any editorial um, list page, but it tends, it's only used at the moment for the front page. And there it was breaking it down, breaking down news layouts, newspaper layouts into abstracts. So we decided that we'd need, we'd divide the page into rows. Then within, within each row, you could have one, two or four columns and within each column, you could have either a single article preview or you could have a list of articles. Um, for each single article, you could have the photo above, the photo below, the photo as a background or no photo. You could have um, black on white or white on black. You could have change the font between the two fonts that were accessible, that were available to, to, to the Gutenberg, to the, sorry, to the byline the time. To the template, yeah. 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 And, um, and then if you had a list, you could choose list by category, list by most recent things, or you could manually go and choose stories. So if you're putting together a page about, for example, Trump, then you could have a big feature story on Trump on the left-hand side, and then a list of secondary stories that you went to manually choose. And this is quite important because this is something, so all of this then Andrew built with Gutenberg. Yeah. Um, and fairly so specific. Let me, uh, let me uh, ask you some questions, Peter, on that. Um, so now you have this um, great editorial or edi editing platform. How do you do the standards of it? Yeah, how do you, are you teaching everybody who's uh, creating articles how to, to change your homepage? Or who is doing that? Or who is responsible for that? For which piece? Well, well, for editorial legal reasons, there's only about two or three of us who do that. I mean, four of us are full-time employees. Uh, everybody else is freelance. They don't get access to the back end. So okay. it comes through myself. Ardeep, who would love to be here and sort of balance things out a bit better, but she's, you know, she doesn't think she knows about software. Actually, she does. She does it now. Uh, it tends to be myself or Ella, our kind of editorial assistant, who does the bit of the front page uh, because they haven't mastered it. But... Hardeep has now become full-time editor, and she's not only changing, well, she's discovered this new thing. She's obviously tightening up the prose. She's a brilliant um, copy editor, brilliant uh, proofreader, but going, ah, oh, she's discovered the article preview system. So now we're getting a lot of sideways traffic. Well, I mean, if there's an article, I'm trying to think one, I don't know, prevent or so, justice. She'll pull up photo background, another article on that subject or by that author to break things up. So I think... Oh. This is when you're embedding the block in a, in a not normal article, I think. I've that, noticed her doing this a lot. So yeah. this is actually using one of the blocks that we built mainly with the home page in mind, but obviously not having to be restricted to that, uh, is now able to be used to produce an article block, a block of an article preview any, in any article throughout the site. So yeah. that provides a way of lateral movement through the site and is kind of... Yeah. A consequence, a natural consequence of the conceptualization of content as blocks, which we didn't particularly need to think of doing in that way, but is, is an automatic. Yeah, we, we stumbled across it. Yeah, we stumbled across it. I thought, oh, you can do this in a post. You can yeah. actually, you know, well, let's do it. We've never done a list preview in a post. You must think about that. Is yeah. it worth us um, doing a quick run through of, yeah. of this? Um, I think we've got time to, to kind of show what yeah. you've done. Okay. It. Shall, I show you, um, shall I sort of do a quick, a, a couple of rows of how the, something like the current homepage, how that might be put together? Right. But you're not changing the live homepage, right? <laughs> well, it's on the uh, live site. We won't, we, won't, we won't say anything about it. So um, let me. Go to right. All right. Okay. All right. So this is the current um, website, the current sort of homepage. So we'll so we'll show. So as you can see, it's got a full article preview block, and then it has some excerpts, and then it has some lists and things like this. So I'll just show roughly how one might go about um, 
you know, something like that. I won't do it on this page, but there was a... Just a little thing, but I like that you only have five items in your top navigation. It's really good. <laughs> Let's find, here we go, here's the... Yeah. All right, that's your ah. the dashboard, yeah. Yes, yeah. actually, this is um, a dashboard that we, well, it's, it's a plugin that Andrew and Joao built. Um, there's kind of like an editorial flow, for, again, for teams, for fairly small teams, like compared with something like Publish Press or, or Edit Flow, it's much more straight, sort of simple, but it gives you a view of content that's often hidden, um, especially with custom post types and Gutenberg and things like this. Anyway, mm -hmm. so um, we, have our kind of, we have some custom uh, blocks, so we'll pick an article preview. I just need to move. Yeah, so and it shows it? by default the latest, the article, latest but, article. But you could but then we then we simply pick exactly. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we'll do um the title of this one. Let me see if it's okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so then it will automatically load the content in. Um to get this particular layout, you have these layout options down the right hand side. So you'd say I want a photo background for this layout. Obviously white te black text on this isn't really going to work. So you say you want light on dark. Um, you might then want to, for example, in this case, hide the date of the article. You might want to keep it left aligned because that's how it is at the moment. Um, then you can customize the content because the title that you added when you were like that's relevant to the post may not be relevant in the context of the home page. So we'll do something like yeah. that. And then we can make that one. So we one of the you know, some of the options are just to make font sizes bigger or smaller, that sort of thing. You might have a lead and you might want a custom lead. You might want to change the the image, but in this case we, we won't. Um, then under that We'll have a so row. Two. Yeah, I just went. We, we we did implemented this before the column block was in um, the release version of WordPress. So now, of course, we could have the column block. But we we had well, the other reason for having our own two up and four up blocks is that we have very specific behaviors um, when it's responsive, which, as we know, Gutenberg is still kind of catching up with. So. So oh, yeah, yeah, we, impl absolutely. we implemented those, yeah, those two column and four column blocks specially to contain um, these layouts on the home page. Yeah. Sorry, Thomas, to no. cut you off in your No, 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 it's good. I'm glad if you talk while I'm doing this because yeah. Yeah, quite... I think that you can change the, the, the lines on, on that, yeah. Um, yeah. On the current home page, you have this S kind of lying down S. Oh, the, yeah, the, 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 um, the borders. Um, I want to say at this point, as a developer, that we um, we couldn't have done this without ACF blocks because it's such a great tool for fast prototyping. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, it has so much, so many components. Um, not just because it's not just to do with the fact that you can do more writing less code. It's also the fact that it has UI elements which Gutenberg still doesn't have. For example, the a UI element to pick an, a piece of content, which ACF calls um, either uh, post object or, or relationship field. That there is no component for that in Gutenberg still or yet. And uh, human made have done a, a plugin component or a library that you can use. But um, we, for, for very fast prototyping of things, without, also without having to worry about the deprecation path of blocks if you change their content. Um, we think, well, I think that um, ACF blocks is a very, very powerful tool, even if the long term goal is to um, is to remove it as a dependency. Maybe. Say, say again. What Sorry, he's looking for ship because I changed the headline. Uh, what was, what uh, should I be looking for? Navy. Navy is the search word. Navy. Oh, <laughs> uh, Navy. Navy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, this, as Thomas is, um, as you can see from Thomas's. Um, uh, quick, quick work on this. He can, they can oh. very quickly put together a homepage, which mm. is, you know, with a lot of visual diversity, um, and yet without actually having to do, you know, lots of design work or lots of layout work or lots of duplicate content entry. Um, right. Yeah. 
And um, are, are these then all uh, completely linked that you kind of click on the image and then it, it yeah. goes to the article? Okay. Exactly. Well, say we want to, if I want to pick a different image for, for that one, let me try to find um, Boris. Uh, oh, the chicken image. <laughs> well, or if I find this one, which is what's used. Yeah. Then, then, then you, you can, can switch, switch the image, image in place. Um, yeah. And then apart from the single previews, I don't know if Thomas, you've already demonstrated that we have kind of lists as well. So you can have a, a, a list of the latest articles. Yeah, I'll on do that. Site. I'll put one in now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's find, uh, for example, so you can pick, pick a category. Yeah, exactly. Category. So you could have, for example, Brexit or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A and they were long enough for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you switch on the images, yeah. Yeah. Um, so say switch on the images, maybe switch off the date. Um, a title as well, you get the whole row of title. Yeah. Uh, so so look, this title. Yeah. I wish was, yeah. while I remember that, I wish we could sometimes change the font of that. Oh, okay. oh yeah. No, I don't think we want you to be able to change the font. You don't want this, but I like this. <laughs> so, we'll discuss it. <laughs> or left and right alignment. Something. <laughs> yeah, true. No, but I mean, this, well, is, this is uh, these conversations are very relevant because you, these are the things that you abstract and decide. You know, should those be features that can be um, that can be modified by the editorial team or editorial team or not? What you don't want is every single piece exactly. of content everywhere to be able to be put in every single available font and every color because no, then no. you're guaranteed to end up with chaos. So this process of, of abstracting exactly yeah. exactly what needs to be flexible and and discarding everything else is I think the kind of key, no, where, I, where the key thought process is in getting to where we've got to now. And, and I must say, but my, my point about that is, it's like one of the few things I think about, oh, maybe after four months, right? So yeah. you've had no complaints. So it's like, we've got so many options, yet there's yeah. a stylistic unity. It's very easy to use once you get your, it takes a half an hour. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. I suppose that's the next true. point to make is that this is a work or the, the, or the, the, the the response to that is this is a work in progress and what we want to do now is take the work we've done so far and start refactoring it so we have um, effectively a, a theme that can then be used by other news publications and um, editorial projects that want to make use of the same kinds of functions. So uh, Thomas, um, yes. when you go back, the, the sidebar um, changes for every block, but the um, the tools are almost always at the same spaces. Is that what I'm seeing? Um, the sidebar, oh, sorry. In the uh, editing. In the editing. In yes. the editing. Well, well actually, block. the sidebar is a different, is a different thing. The sidebar, we, we you no, can no, have. The, 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 the block sidebar. So when you have a, a block select. Yeah, the, the, not, yeah, not, not, not the yeah. page sidebar, the block, oh, the block, the block editing tools, yeah. Yes, at the moment they are. Um, well, they're in the sidebar, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, they're always in the same places because you always have mostly the same changes that you make, just how they are then changed we, exactly. into the block. Yeah, that's the thing. Because, because a lot of the time you're just selecting existing stories. But I mean, if you want to build something, to use kind of the classic Gutenberg blocks, like title mm -hmm. blocks or something. Like at the moment on the um, on this page, there's a, um, a block that says at the top, which says what next. So, I mean, if, you, if you're back in... Um, Kind of classic, yeah. uh, it turns out, you know, you can still use the, the classic things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you when you go back to one of the other blocks, um, yeah. and uh, you had one section in there that is to change the font of the headline. Yes. Yeah. In the design. Which headline is it? Sorry. Any headline that you're just kind of the, the headline. Okay. All right. Like that. So yeah. we'll set up a number of fonts that were, that are like, basically there are, I mean, actually IA Writer doesn't use so much, but it uses Averia or Averia. To, that was chosen to give this kind of slightly ink that's soaked into the page. Then there's Altgothic when you need a more, like, a, well, it's actually not Altgothic, it's ITC Franklin, but Franklin Gothic. But um, when you need that news, big, all caps kind of headline, and then there's Caslon, which is the body font of the site. So it allows you that amount of flexibility, but it updates automatically, it updates from here at the moment. So whether that will change, because we're now, I'm sure, uh, Andrew, we're um, about to build these blocks as native Gutenberg blocks. 
So some of the position of controls and things will change from being here to being more familiar. So yeah. In the... yeah, yeah. There's, so there's some of the individual element editing things will be moved in line because these at the moment are still ACF blocks because really the, you know, we, we, everything was prototyped in a very short space of time and the site was launched in a sort of, you know, perpetual beta kind of mode mindset. But yeah. now we're at the point where we're convinced that these blocks serve their purpose. And so we are in the process of um, implementing them as fully native. So, so the things that are content specific rather than block level. So the, 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 the controls that you can see now um, or could just see now yeah. are block level, they will say yeah. as, as yeah. they are, but the things that are, that are content specific. So editing a headline and, and uh, tweaking an image, we'll be moving them in line. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think so, that's um, that's a pretty good yeah rundown of of what, I switch out how to, that works. Let's yeah. stop the sharing now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I'm I'm really glad that you are um, you're demoing uh, demoing doing that. So um, what else is um kind of helping or um, uh, educating that um, editorial process? Is that um, yeah because we only saw the front page. Um, yeah. You're doing those also to category pages, I understood? No, actually, at the moment, you could do. We could use them for category pages, but that was another thing was to take out some of the, the paralysis, um, at least initially, was to just build category pages mm -hmm. um, using... As aut automatic lists, basically. Right. Yeah. Uh, although, although they on a, on a code level, they use the same... Um, they use almost identical uh, markup and CSS as the blocks, uh, as the Guten blocks themselves. So you see, there's a lot of consistency, even right. though the, the the they're rendered, even though the, the code that's rendering the the list pages is um, yeah. is not passing through an editor. HP rendering there. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. Worth talking, and you explained to me how you did this. One of the key things I think I explained at the beginning was that I wanted to separate fact and argument, and actually Jay Rosen the great um, NYU professor, you know, he wrote this essay in 2013 or a talk he gave in Australia. He said all newspapers, and this inspired me, should be separated in a quadrant. So, so there's so much PI, you should have appearances, realities, and you should have facts and arguments. And that's an old Russian and Polish things, facti argumenti. So I kind of took that. And then, of course, when I was playing around pre-Gutenberg and uh, and you know, WordPress site with this, with this, what was it called? Superhero. I CSS super. I made some terrible mistakes. I was ruining everything, but I found it very, very difficult to find a way of categorizing those four things. And so Thomas and Andrew have come up. Not only does the everything come under those four sections we allocate, we also get these great. I'm trying to find one a dedicated investigation or. We call them subsections or investigations. Where so when you go there, you have so if you go to fact or argument, they have people. Yeah, we built, basically, they were custom taxonomies. So when we started working on the site, there were there was a the standard taxonomy, and then there were tags, and um, that meant it was impossible to to guarantee that a story would be under one of these four quadrants. And since Peter said something, this is fundamental to the site. So said, right, we'll have a custom taxonomy that is only fact, argument, reportage, and culture. And the story has to belong to one of those. Then you've got a standard kind of category tree for things like, you know, countries or people or whatever. And then you have um, a, another, custom, another custom taxonomy for investigations or lines of reporting that Peter and the team are following, stories that they're following. So although the lists are generated automatically, um, at least for now, um, there's quite a lot of flexibility in terms of what sorts of lists you can end up on or what you can, how you can see things. At the same time, there's not quite as much sprawl as you can often get on WordPress websites where the temptation is just like 15 categories and four to seven tags. Yeah. Yeah. And then everything is everywhere and you've got no delineation of content. So yeah. Um, luckily, people are very clear. Right? I think one other um, list page, so to speak, on the site that's used as the home page template. So it can be used for thematic groupings, yeah. um, but using allowing the lists to just also populate, I think, is the kind of um, 
the you know friction reducing uh, choice in most situations and for a f- small team that's that's obviously very interesting rather than, yeah. rather than having to uh, manually generate the category page for every single category um, but but there is the choice it's possible yeah. to immediately set up using the set using the home page template that um, we've just demoed it's oh, possible okay. to set up any other thematic page and populate it in the same way and then because because the list um, blocks for example use latest content or can use latest content you can still set up you can still manually set up an editorial overview page which will then automatically update as articles are published in that category so you have the choice if needs be if you want something a bit more pictorial um with a larger image and so on then you can you can set up you can manually use that the template that we've got we've shown there to set up that kind of page yeah yeah and when peter needs it then uh then he can have it yeah. So um, uh, now your your operation is also not online, but also there's a print edition, and I think it's a it's very unique. It's not unique to to the the space, but it's uh, unique that an online uh, magazine has actually weekly editions. Yeah, normally monthly at the moment. At the moment. Because um, normally you're just going to put the new stuff up there and then it kind of rolls on the front page and you have to update it every day with the new stories coming in. Yeah, But you you make a decision to have the same week, one week, the same homepage, like a newspaper. Oh, yeah. yeah so you're right. Weekly, we do a fixed homepage. And what we do is that uh, we, you know, we screenshot it, thank all the writers, and that's our summary of the week. Um, and... And what happens is on that form, basically the homepage is there and you've got your side columns, you play around with those. And then on the Monday, we flip it over. So the latest articles are the first you see on mobile view and not an ad for the festival. And then the homepage remains static until the next Friday. And that's a model for, we're only doing it once a month at the moment because it's a huge design overload. As Thomas can tell you, uh, we, <laughs> is we do a monthly paper, a newspaper, mm-hmm. which is uh, beautiful. This is the best edition so far. Have you seen the physical copy yet? Either? Are you no, on the main? No, well, I, I won't I'll get that. Yeah, well, yes, they're all mailed out uh, today, I think. And so this is a weird synergy. So I, I don't know why, you know, Thomas is mainly involved, uh, unlike Andrew, on the, on, the, on the physical newspaper, and I was ill last weekend, so he's heavily involved. Uh, and I think some of the divine innovations from the website, don't you think, Andrew? go back and affect the newspaper. And obviously, the website emulates a physical newspaper to a certain yeah. amount. And we use some of the colors from the website. It's just a very interesting kind of backwards and forwards between the physical and the digital. Yeah. Has... Go ahead. No, it's OK. Carry on. I was hoping one of you guys would step in, or you. I was, I was only going to mention something that's slightly tangential, but that um, we we. Well, we let, let, let me stay back to the print edition. Yeah, say, yeah. Oh, you are not setting the print edition with copy paste the articles from, or are you pushing, or are you doing that, or are you pushing yeah. data from? That, that from was the what, website. That's what Andrew was going to say. That was what I was about to mention. Actually, um, we we built a very lightweight plugin. Um, which exports plain text um, versions of the article. So it needs to strip out the Gutenberg comments um, and deliver plain text in order to be imported into InDesign. Uh, and we've discovered, I- interestingly, that um, InDesign isn't receptive at all to HTML or pretty much any format that we could um, naturally get out. And nothing like... We were, we were thinking of doing... Um, I don't think oh, like wow. data merges and, and XML, XML merges and, and kind of hoping that we'd be able to get at least kind of header hierarchies into InDesign. It's, it's also not doing a markdown or any of that? No, it's terrible. Well, it, it's brilliant, but it doesn't do any of that. It's brilliant, but it's not interested in, <laughs> it's not interested in the web. Um, no, no. So we, we built a very lightweight plugin um, to uh, basically generate a plain text, well, a, a sort of human formatted plain text list of all of the articles that have been published on the site in a particular um, date range. And so that then serves as the basis for, yes, copy pasting, but um, with some of the friction removed. Yeah, I mean, actually, it serves as, a, if anything, I'm not sure if it does, it can serve as a, as a basis for then further sub-editing 
but in theory, if one were to use this plugin, and I'm not sure that we actually use it that much on the site yet, but it's, it could be a boom because it, it can allow you to have things structured for the way you want your print version to appear. So it can extract just the meta fields or the, the, in the order that you want, the header, the lead paragraph, the, the author byline, mm. the, the, the bits that you need in the order that you need from your website. So you can mm. allow, theoretically, one could allow, if it weren't for legal things, one could allow a distributed news, news team to feed into the CMS rather than sharing Google Docs or sharing Word documents back and forth, which other, other clients of ours are kind of forced to do. You put everything into the website, then you get everything out of the website, and you can make the most of what WordPress offers, like revisions and um, you know, user-specific editing and this kind of thing. So, which, by which I mean, you know, users editing their own stuff. Um, so it's very promising, but. Um, <coughs> The, 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 article, the body of the article, you're still copy paste over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, yeah. And this is, uh, so, I mean, I, 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 you know, Cardi's been doing mostly, um, she tends to work in a Google Doc at night. She hasn't quite got her head round no, this no. plug in that exports. And she certainly, she doesn't understand InDesign. So I just, if I was slightly, maybe I could just feed that straight into the InDesign story editor. And, you know, you know, Thomas has set up these brilliant tags that will recognize somebody's name and form it, format it, book compressed Gothic, you know. Um, but uh, but we also, we do edit down for the newspaper because the space yeah. it is, right. you know, you know, you, you often edit down a thousand word down to 800 or something, you want to put it on the page. But the, the interesting thing is, and this is why I think it's got a premium and got about a thousand subscribers now, we have to, to break even, we have to get 5,000 subscribers annually. But um, uh, is the, it's very, very different. I wish I had brought a copy with me here today. Um, I probably got one in the other room. But, you know, to see things juxtaposed with full color quality. I did a poem illustrated by a famous cartoonist, that's, which will not read on the web. It's so detailed. But it's also, you know, the, the sense that most are, I think, you know, when we produce the monthly paper and as we increase articles, we can go bi-weekly and then weekly is a lot of people miss stuff. Because you go, we're mainly from social media. People go to the front page a lot and look around. But generally, they're going straight from a Facebook or Twitter. Yeah. And they might go to another article, but often they don't. And they stumble upon the sort of heuristics of physicality. Oh, that's a really lovely picture of the moon. I Thomas did a brilliant thing. He had a whole thing about the desert, you know, celebrate the moon landing. Yeah. And it was like two in the morning, I think he did this when I was ill. He went to the manual, didn't you? The, and you did it all the font style of yeah. the Pono manual. Yeah, so the things you can do in print that are very nice, very satisfying as a designer. But of course, if you start doing that online, then you're in the realms of, you know, the Guardian or the New York Times or the Washington Post where you need dedicated data visualizers and dedicated designers and front-end uh, developers and a whole, a much bigger newsroom. So it's fantastic to be able to do that on the print version, but that's not what, what the aim is. Like, I mean, well, I we, might, that, we might feed back some of these ideas at some yeah. point, because we've created now such a clean cut palette. We haven't, uh, thanks to Thomas, you've given us these good limitations and they've been enough. But maybe, I don't know, we could think about it. It's, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And the problem is most people are reading on a phone. So why would you bother designing amazing Apollo manual? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's actually quite straightforward because that at least was done on a typewriter. So you could do that. But yeah, um, it would be lovely to do, to do these things as well. But I do think, I kind of agree, like what you said there about limitation, like the limitations that some of the things that we've done in Gutenberg specifically, the limitations are what allow you more f freedom or more yeah. creativity because it still remains consistent and you're not having to worry eternally yeah. about choices mm. and what format and should I do it as an SVG or a PNG or this or that or the other or whatever and um, it's, it's the limitations that make byline times look trustworthy and consistent yeah and so I agree. We could we can do a lot more, and a lot more things will happen. No, no, no. I just wonder occasionally it would feed back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consistent and speed for us. Because sometimes yeah. we're having a great speed, 
lawyers, everything's involved. We want to scoop. We don't, you know, it's nothing. Most things aren't features. Right. And so the most design in the paper goes in the feature stuff, you know. But when you're pouncing out a news story, you know, you don't, you know, you need to get out before the opposition get out. Right? Yeah. So um, uh, this is uh, lovely, and I probably could talk another two hours with you. Yeah. <laughs> great talk. It's only one hour. Did it feel like two? Yeah. It's already... <laughs> no, it felt like about 20 minutes. Well, oh, we, yeah. we oh, don't yeah. have a limit, but I have a limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I want to, uh, want to um, give Thomas and Andrew another chance to also talk about what's next with this plot when you say, well, you had it, but then you want to go and abstract it for to be used by more uh, news outlets or local news that have small yeah. teams. Yeah, maybe you can uh, elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, Andrew, do you want to talk about that a bit? Uh, yes, sure. I mean, um, we, I think we've, we, given how well it seems to have gone, we feel, and encouragement from Peter and so on, and also some of the, there are some projects connected to Byline Times um, that, um, already seem like they could make good use of these tools so the, the plan now is basically to evolve what we've done specifically for Byron Times into the beginning of a platform um, which we which or you know which will include a suite of tools around layout and also editorial workflows for collaborative um, setups um, which which will then the idea is then to make them available for other people to use um, and um, we the next step, we're working on it already, but the next step or a key step is that we're, um, the, by, there's a byline festival at the end of August that we will be hosting some workshops at. So anyone watching who is keen to continue to um, hear more can, uh, can look into that. Um, and then from there, we will, yeah, we, we, we are, I mean, I suppose we, we've been talking about it internally as the white label version of the byline template. So it doesn't have an official name yet, but it will. Um, and um, I suppose we should mention that um, it's in a it's in the space same space as Newspack, um, which is this fledgling mm -hmm. um, platform from WordPress. Well, we, we, yeah, from from sorry, exactly from Automatic using also using WordPress. But um, whereas uh, I, I think we are probably talking about different target audiences, um, we, whereas they're talking about. Um, you know, investing whatever it is, millions into a, a platform that then will cost thousands to license. I think we're talking about doing something that will be licensable to, to smaller newsrooms on much tighter budgets, um, who we feel, and I think, um, yeah, we've been, as I say, encouraged by Peter in this, um, you know, our need, need to be able to do things with, without giant, budgets because it's difficult in for journalists now very very difficult and it's become more difficult so that's kind of the roadmap or the general overview of what we're looking to do with this um it's um, basically yeah make it available to more users yeah and so people could get in touch with either because we're still at the kind of gathering feedback and deciding what what direction this is going to go whether people get in touch with us through byline through byline times or through yesywork.com or at Byline Festival, we'd be really, really thrilled to have. Yeah, we'd love to have feedback and, and have as many conversations as, as yeah. uh, you know, as, as come our way awesome. about what, what would be useful, what people want to see, what, what mm -hmm. um, edit, the editorial challenges in digital are for, for journalists and small teams at the moment. Um, so, how, Peter, what is exactly your business model? Do you have a PayPal? Um, I didn't see one, that's why I'm asking. Or are you, it's all about uh, the business model, it's not a PayPal that you pay for? No. Okay. No, we have talked about, and I'm involved in a kind of some strange Bitcoin micro tipping system called Bywire, but I don't think that'll ever happen. And actually, Thomas and I spoke about sort of micro tipping. Uh, we're open to all options. I think that's the thing. Any, so, we are going to launch. Hopefully, a crowdfunder soon, uh, which, uh, you know, Andrew is developing the actual software for a plugin. But I think it I will think, be a Gutenberg block. I think that's relevant to say in this talk. Right. Yeah. It's a Gutenberg block as a crowdfunding thing. Yeah. So, like my, our primary art is going to be now we've got up to 400, we've got 400,000 visitors for the last two months, each month. So that gets you into the advertising model, especially if they advertise and also can do things at the festival. Uh, and subscriptions. I so said that surprised us. 
how many people and the profit margins on, you know, people will pay £2.50 that we can discount for something that if you print enough costs a pound to print because they want it. So it's kind of, it's an old fashioned model, you know, that people will pay for the content and advertising well. And, um, and I don't think, we do hold some back, some exclusive content for the print edition or hat, but people don't really mind about that. I think they like the experience of having read it online and then seeing it in print, slightly edited down next to something else. That, that our stories, I think our journalism is quite long, it's not long form, they're short, but we are talking about big stories like yeah. Trump, Russia, Brexit, and aren't reported elsewhere, like you know, Ukraine, and so they don't go out of date. So it's the subscription model, but you don't have a paper lot that people that are not paying you. So it's more a public radio kind of model that is funded by a few, but listen to all of them. Yes, I suppose there's that, but the, the, I think the print edition, and the other thing we found, we haven't, we haven't got to this yet and we're still developing it, but people pay premium to have their name on the front of the paper to come to a club. So that's when I took over bylight.com, the crowdfunding site, my co-director Stephen, background advertising, you'll never make money out of this. What you will make money out of, and not vast amounts enough to pay more journalists, is events. Okay. So yeah. we have a monthly... Um, it's quite a big event. Like, how you missed it last uh, month? Um, Thomas yeah. had a hundred yeah. people to talk about criminal justice and miscarriages of justice. Hopefully, you're getting a media gentleman next um, September. This is the Windrush scandal. All these immigrants, migrants, you know, some British citizens got sent back to the Caribbean. Um, so it's it really doing everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to a micro tipping thing. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever have. I'm not sure about pay, maybe exclusive con premium content on a time limited paywall. Mm -hmm. Options there, maybe, but you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but there's the advertising model that you um, also offer your advertisers um, ads in the print model as well as online. And then sponsorship of the best ones. Well. So, yeah. so, so, quite ethical, a bunch of some ethical investment company. So, people like Lush, you know. There are many advertisers who want to make an impact, but as we grow, I think after you go to half a million, you do unlock some of that. We'll have to see how really. Yeah. Another thing that we that we sort of Andrew and I have have discussed from the point of view of the white label, I think we discussed it. I think we discussed it with you, Peter. Is like because we built it for somebody else. This idea of almost small ad listings. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. So where your readers themselves, your community is able to advertise. We've done this for a, a Greek and Cypriot cultural centre that we build the website for in London. And they have, they have um, ads for and from the Greek Cypriot community in London. And they charge a decent amount to put an ad, a time limited ad on their website. But they're not ads, they're not the Gucci it's ads. Class, they're, they're classified, the classic classified. They are, absolutely, they're that's like what the they pay are, by yeah. Word, pay by week. Yeah. But Craig well, Newman made his... Uh... Yeah, but if that works, let us know because we do. We have an interesting thing which is all along that line. We don't charge for the moment, but it's like our fourth most popular regular page. It's called um, Radical Cities, and that's an activist calendar uh, where every day, every week they fill this calendar of what's going on across the UK. All kinds of activism, not any political. So I think yeah, that that's really good to get. Sometimes it can be advertising. It might be other forms of community engagement. Yeah, but Peter's incredibly dynamic, like open to absolutely everything, doing a million different things. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, yeah it, it, it's quite inspiring to see someone kind of really have this, this vision and yeah. go out and try it and see how it works and then bring it in a bigger context and say, well, well, that didn't work, but let's go to the next yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, we're really lucky to met Andrew and Thomas. I'm not as big a mark as they Well, we're really boys. <laughs> but, it, but also they get it immediately, you know, and sort of it's, you know, I think because they've had this background it's in terms of and design and code, but but a kind of holistic way is just being, you know, I just thank God for that press regulator meeting. <laughs> well, yeah. I've met Thomas. You wouldn't think that's where you'd find, you know, your, your nirvana, your technical nirvana, but... Uh, and, you know, and I think, you know, hopefully we can spread this out. The white labor thing is also about monetizing a bit, making everything sustainable. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But also, you know, other people can, you know, you know, build 
these um, attractive and authoritative sites. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, a lot of mo- uh, local news out there that don't get any help. They just muddle through it and have a really hard time yeah. uh, figuring it out for themselves because they're not the technology savvy. They don't look around over the the, the, the hill, so to speak, and then they're stuck in their, their old 20th century advertising. That, they, that is precisely the target market of what, what we now hope to make. And, um, and Gutenberg is fundamental to that happening yeah. Yeah. Um, just to bring yeah. it all together <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, yeah yeah no but uh, but absolutely you know it's it's um and in that sense i think we're you know we followed all of the controversy around um gutenberg and we ha- we we were in two minds at, at, about certain things and still are but um for this pro- kind of project it's undoubtedly a blessing yeah. compared to to compared to what we had before and it still has a long way to go. The, the, you know, there are lots of things that need to be improved. Yep. Um, and um, well, it's a it's first year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Much. exactly. It really yeah. needs to go. And they are doing a lot of things from the ground up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. A lot of people have already solved that problem. They kind of want to push it a little bit further than anybody had it before. So it's a it's an interesting uh, um time in kind of talking to to the developer team and and around the the Gutenberg um, platform. All right, well, I'm so happy. As I said, I could talk to you another two hours. Um, And I'm so glad that you took the time to to be together on on, uh, and uh, tell us about your Byline Times work and uh, what's that's the future for local news. And I'm glad that we you heard it here first. (laughs) <laughs> Brilliant. Thank Thanks you for right. inviting us. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah. Do you have anything that you want to point people to apart from your own websites and the bylineplans.com? Well, um, we, we just set up a page because we thought it might be useful to have somewhere that anyone that does see this can go to. So we actually put a page on yesweweb.com slash news platform where people can go to to just get in touch with us. And as there are more details about what we're doing with Peter and with Byline and where it goes from there on, We'll build it there. Okay. Well, uh, we we'll have some. I'm going there now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we work.com slash news platform. I've got it, um, mate. And we've put an email address there to contact us and, and, uh, and yeah. so on. And we had, um, uh, one um, lady came in after um, a few. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's Anne. Um, and she said, thanks, everyone. Uh, looks like a very useful tool. And, uh, yeah, brilliant. Great to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So, um, waving towards Anne, yeah. <laughs> and saying goodbye to you. And yeah. I will put the link in the show notes in the YouTube thing. So people oh, yeah. All Thanks right. You very Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Cheers.